Good morning. Welcome to Maple Avenue Ministries. It's good to see what faces we can see today. And we think also of all those that um, we miss dearly who join us through Facebook, um, those who are traveling and away from us right now. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, hear this call to worship. You know what time it is. Now is the moment for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to, you, to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Come, let us worship God. We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ. Advent means coming. We are preparing for the full coming of God's kingdom. A reading from the book of Isaiah. They, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Prepare the way of the Lord. We light this candle in hope, the hope of our coming Savior, Jesus. Prepare then the way of the Lord. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. 
quick. Emily gave me permission <laughs> to say this, but um, there's a, a group called The Simple Way. Um, Shane Claiborne is part of that. Um, and I've been kind of off and on following them over years. And they, uh, they have an interesting practice, a discipline they've started where they actually literally turn weapons into garden tools. And so there's a cool little four and a half minute video that we will post on the Mamley website. Uh, so you can check that out. Good morning, Maple Avenue. I, uh, happy Thanksgiving. Um, thank you. Um, over this Thanksgiving, I have been meditating on aspects of God. So this morning in worship, I want to bring you through a, a, a multitude of different aspects of God. If you pay attention to what the songs we sing, maybe some new ones, some ones we also do know, um, pay attention to what they actually say, and you will see the different aspects of God. That is what I was thankful for this Thanksgiving.
goodness, we also see that our God has something that nothing else has. He has a, a love that, that is so, it's so abundant that it at times can be reckless. Can we, can, can, can I get an amen, somebody please?
next song I was introduced to by a couple of friends. We were listening to worship songs in an act to get closer. We just needed to get closer. And I was, I was taught in this next song that God does something that, that you wouldn't think. God breaks us intentionally. Now you might be thinking, God, I'm broken. Why, why did this happen to me? But what if that was God that did it, but he breaks us with grace? Just, just sit with that. Maybe, maybe that's what God is trying to do. Just sit with that, maybe.
Why is it that when we come here on Sundays, we make a practice of confessing our sins? Is it because we need to have them wiped clean before we can proceed? Is it because, um, is it because it's just a habit? Well, it seems that one of the things that we can learn from doing confession is not how bad we are, but how great God is. Not that we have to cover every single thing that we can think of. We trust that God's assurance of pardon lasts from the time we first believe onward. And so instead of doing the uh, prayer of confession first, I want to start with our assurance of pardon. Hear this from Zephaniah 3. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Knowing that you are already forgiven, let's focus now in our prayer of confession, not just how lowly we are, but how great God is and bringing honor to his name by recognizing that. Please pray with me. Lord, we have not kept watch for you. We have occupied ourselves with our own concerns. We have not waited to find your will for us. We have not noticed the needs of the people around us. We have not acknowledged the love that has been shown to us. Forgive us for our lack of watchfulness. Help us to wait to know your will. Help us to look out for the needs of others. Help us to work and watch for your coming. In Jesus' name, amen knowing already that you are forgiven, that Christ has paid the cost, let us now greet each other in Christ's peace, knowing that we are all forgiven and loved.
Good morning, Maple Avenue. Peace of Christ be with you this morning. And welcome to Advent. This morning is the first Sunday of Advent, and thank you to the Rosing family for lighting the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope. Advent is the time leading up to Christmas. Advent is celebrated in the four weeks leading up to the birth of Christ, and it's a time of waiting, of expectation, of longing. And so during this time, we hope. We hope for the coming of Christ. We long for the day when Christ returns again, and, and we wait in expectation to be swept up and sitting at that great banquet feast. And so, thank you to the Rosings. If you would like to participate, if you, yourself, your friend, a couple, a couple of friends, your household would like to participate in the lighting of the candle, please let me know, and we'd love to invite you to be a part of that. We have a few other announcements this morning. You can see in our bulletin the nominations for elder and deacon. These people have received the, the nomination, have prayed and discerned, and have responded with an acceptance of that nomination. And so um, we put these names before you now for the next two weeks leading up to our congregational meeting on December 12th, directly following the service, where we will vote on the ballot of these names. We will also be voting on our proposed budget for the year of 2022, which our deacons have worked tirelessly to put forward. You can find hard copies in the back on the table in the narthex, or if you go to our website, even on the main page, there's a button, it's easy to find. Um, and we invite you to bring your questions, your comments, your concerns to um, myself or to the deacons um, in preparation for that congregational meeting on December 12th. As always, Wednesdays here at MAM, we begin the morning at eight. Or yeah, we begin the morning at 8:30 with our midweek prayers. You can join us either in the Gold Room or on Zoom, and then we end the evening. Uh, with women's Bible study in the blue room. That's at six o'clock, right, Miss Maggie? Yep, there's a misprint in the bulletin. I apologize about that. That, that women's Bible study is at 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. Um, I was also just struck during that last song, thank you, Christopher and team, for leading us in worship this morning. Um, remind me of that, the beginning verse, uh, take, Take all I have in my hands or, and multiply it. Um, a few moments before that, one of the ushers brought this beautiful pine cone to me that is a gift to the church from one of our young ones. And then we sang that song about taking all that we have in our hands and, and God being able to multiply it. And I looked up here and I saw these beloved friends leading worship and using their gifts and talents. And I'm reminded of those in the balcony who are joining us and serving. And I know all y'all have gifts and talents and, and so much to offer the church and, and the kingdom of God. And so I'd just like to invite you, whatever you have, a beautiful pine cone, the ability to sing, whatever it is, um, I invite you to bring it, bring it to the Lord. Um, and thank you to our young friend for this. And with that spirit, 
of giving, I'd like to invite forward uh, Deacon Laura with some news about Giving Tuesday. Thank you. Um, as you know, Giving Tuesday has become a, I don't know, a phenomenon in America? Is it worldwide? I have no idea. But Giving Tuesday, what a gift that is to um, so many people, right? Where it's not, yes, this is a time where we are thankful for what we have and thinking about um, what God has given us. And then as we get to now give um, and bless others, that is what... Um, that day is all about. So anyway, that is happening Tuesday um, online. I think it started through Facebook years ago, right? But what Facebook does is all of these different organizations put out a, here's what I'm raising money for. Um, and then Facebook will match that and multiply those gifts. And Giving Tuesday has become this rolling out of your gifts and people add on to those and they become even greater gifts. So. All of that to say, that's happening on Tuesday, and we at Maple Ave have decided to give to our organizations that bless our community, bless our youth specifically in our community, recognizing that our youth here at Maple Avenue are a very important piece to what we do, and also recognizing that we at Maple Ave right now are stretched thin in terms of what we can and can't do physically in this building right now, right? We're searching for pastor, we are searching for, you know, we're doing our vision team things, and we are feeling like at our max to be able to do what we can, but at the same time celebrating the many people from our congregation who are doing that work. And that is what we want to celebrate for Giving Tuesday. So we are partnering with those, with four um, community partners, uh, Escape Ministries, Harmony Scholars, I Am Academy, and the West Core Neighborhood, um, recognizing that those four, and yes, there are more organizations, but those are the four that came to our mind and our hearts of there are good things happening and we want to support them. So know that you're giving on Tuesday. If you go on to Facebook, um, Facebook actually matches up to $2 million. That's not, obviously, not from us, like $2 million across the board from all these things that are happening. The earlier in the day that you get on there and give, they will match more. So they match 100% of what you are giving um, up to 2 million. And then after that, they match 10% of what you give. So if you get on there at you know 6 a.m., starts at 8, thank you. If you get on there right at 8 a.m., the chances of your gift of $10 goes much farther, right? Because they will match that 100%. Um, but obviously, they are still matching even past that, but that will be then 10%. So anyway, all of that to say, that is through Facebook. If you are not a Facebook person, that's okay. There's also going to be a way to do this via Tithely through our website. So go to Maple Ave Giving page, and there will be all kinds of instructions there too, and you can also give through that. And then we will be dividing out whatever comes in um, out toward those four community partners, which we're very excited to do. So um, if you have any questions about that, please find me or another deacon this morning. We would love to answer the questions about that. Um, but thank you for giving. Thank you for supporting our youth, our community. Um, that is what we are called to do here at 427 Maple Ave. So um, blessings on you this week. Um, and may you continue to give and may we all be multiplied in what we do and how we serve. I don't want to assume that everybody else feels the way that I do or thinks the way that I do, which is probably a good wisdom for life. But um, so many times we come across, uh, upon this season of Advent, <clears throat> and I don't know, it's like, okay, well, Christ has come already. I'm not waiting for that. And he'll come again. Yeah, we're waiting for that. But what is it? What is it that we're waiting for, even in that, in that second coming? What are we waiting for? And so today in uh, our congregational prayer, 
I want us to focus on, on the things that we are waiting for. Let's go to God in prayer. Lord our God, how majestic is your name. We thank you for all that you have provided for us, the ways in which you love us. But Lord, sometimes we don't feel that love. Sometimes we are just people waiting. Sometimes we are waiting for a paycheck. Sometimes we are waiting to be seen by other people. Sometimes we are waiting to feel loved. Sometimes we are waiting for our faith, our faith to be stronger, for our prayers to be answered. O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. There are those of us who are waiting for someone to share life with. There are those who face such agony and physical pain, they're just waiting for relief. And many who are waiting for deliverance from anxiety, depression, and despair. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Some of us are waiting for the start of a family. And some of us are waiting for healing amidst the brokenness of marriages. Some of us are waiting for an adopted child to come home. O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel. We here at Maple Avenue are, are waiting, waiting for a new pastor, a new chapter. We are waiting for, um, we're waiting for COVID, so many of the restrictions to lift so that we can embrace each other once more in the ways we are familiar with. O come, O come, Emmanuel. God, we're waiting for justice. We are waiting for broken institutions to... <laughs> We're waiting for institutions to recognize the wrongs that live within their bylaws and their modes of operation. We're waiting. We're waiting, Lord, for we're waiting, Lord, for Dr. King's dream. Oh come, oh come, Emmanuel. Lord, we are waiting for peace. We don't know what that would look like. Not, not likely to happen on a global scale. Not until you're coming. And so we wait, Lord. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. We are not just left here waiting, though, Lord. We, 
we already have your love, though we may not always be able to see it or feel it. Lord, we have your assurance to us. Lord, let us not just be idle in our waiting, but let your Holy Spirit reign within us. May it shape us and form us to help be the thing that someone is waiting for in their life. Lord, it is your world. It is your peace. It is your shalom, your wholeness. Lord, help us to be wholeness makers, shalom makers in our families, in our church, in our community, in our nation, and in the world. And where we lack the vision for what that may look like, Lord, we pray that you will spark our imaginations and help us to be agents of your change in our waiting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. that you would be with us in this moment. That, Father, that the word that you have for us today would come alive. Father, you know uh, the thoughts, you know the needs, you know the hurts, you know the pains that every single one of us deal with. You know the things that we've we've cried about and asked you about in the secret places of our, of our homes and in our bedrooms. You know about the internal struggles that we uh, uh, externally try to cover up. God, we pray that this word would speak directly to those issues. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, not just because it is a lamp unto our feet, and a light into our path, but because your word is sustenance, your word is food, your word is nourishment, your word is hope, your word is joy, your word is peace, and God, we need that today. God, we thank you that you promised us that you would never leave us, that you promised us that you would never forsake us. And not only did you say it, but over and over and over, you have proven yourself to be a promise keeper. So we thank you. And we come to this moment knowing, God, that just as you've kept every other promise, you will keep this promise to us today. So as always, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, my strength and my redeemer. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say amen. 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 Today we will be in Luke, the first chapter, beginning at the fifth verse. Sit down. Go ahead, sit down. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Sit down. Don't stand up. Sit down. Sit down. In today's text, we are introduced to a priest by the name of Zechariah. As a priest in the temple, Zechariah's role uh, was to go before God for the people and to be a representative of God for before the people. During this time, 
excuse me, during the time of David, uh, the, the number of the priesthood had become so large that David separated uh, the priesthood into divisions. And Zechariah was in uh, the eighth of the eight divisions, which is the division of Abijah. Um, today, and also in today's text, we are introduced to Zechariah's wife, uh, whose name is... Elizabeth. Elizabeth means God is faithful. And Elizabeth was also of the priestly order, as she, the scripture says, is a descendant of Aaron. Zechariah, according to today's passage, were, they were uh, righteous before God. The, the passage says they lived blamelessly according to the regulations and to the commandments. Now, this means that, that it doesn't mean that they were perfect. It doesn't mean that they were sinless. But what this means is that Zachariah and Elizabeth uh, lived lives that no one could, could put their name in a scandal. Or this meant that Zachariah and Elizabeth uh, had a good marriage. It meant that they lived a life that was pleasing to God. Zachariah and Elizabeth uh, um, um, they tried their very best to do uh, and follow all of the commandments that God had given them, all of the ordinance that God had given them. Zechariah and Elizabeth were not, were not messy people. They weren't petty people. But yet, Zechariah and Elizabeth had no children. Zechariah and Elizabeth uh, uh, being the great people, the good people who, who, who Luke says that they were, had to deal with infertility. For those who, 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 might, not, who might not remember or who, who weren't here, a couple of weeks ago when I was here, Psalms 127 talks about how, how remember how children were a blessing of God. They were a sign that God favored you. Um, having children meant that, that you had a better chance of climbing the economic and social ladder. Having children, having the, the more children you had during this time meant the more God favored you. It meant that you would have a better social security check because uh, you would have people who would be able to represent your business, um, who would be able to represent your issues, who would be better in position to make sure that the justice issues that were, were necessary for your flourishing would be able to be done. But Zachariah and Elizabeth, who were these wonderful people who were blameless, were childless. Hmm. Uh, that's meant for Elizabeth that, that, that when she walked around the city, everybody recognized that she didn't have any children. And, and for us, um, for, 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 for the, uh, us in this time who have had to deal with this, with this dilemma, with this issue, we understand the amount of, of pain and the amount of, of guilt and the amount of shame and how hard it is to, to have to be, want children and, and not be able to have them. But it was even greater uh, in, this, in this period because for a woman, um, it was seen that this was your sole purpose for being born, was to have children. And Elizabeth, who by all accounts was a good woman, who did everything that God wanted her to do, was, was good to her family, could not have any children. Not only did, 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 she have to, did she have to deal with walking around the street and not being able to have children, but, but she had every holiday, uh, it was a remembrance that, hey, uh, once again, I don't, I don't have any kids. If, if, if you're not married or don't have any children, you know that every holiday somebody's going to come and ask you, so when are you going to have some babies? <sighs> when are you going to get married? Lord, sorry, that was a moment. Um, but, but you understand the shame and the pressure of Elizabeth. The Bible says that, that, that also as a woman during this time, if you were unable to have children, that your husband could divorce you. Uh, uh, that's how important this was. And in some instances, um, there would be husbands 
who, who would want to remain married, but, but the wives would say, no, you need to go ahead and divorce me because the shame and, and, and the pain was so heavy that they would just want to not have to deal with this at all. Elizabeth and Zachariah had to deal with this on a day in and day out basis. And now, Elizabeth and Zechariah are old. They've been dealing with this for the entire time of their marriage. They've been dealing with this day in, day out, year in, year out, holiday after holiday, day after day, praying, God, we're doing the best that we can. Show us that you favor us. Give us a child and show us that you love us. Zechariah was a priest, which meant that his job was to go into the temple. And as he went into the temple, he had to go knowing that he couldn't even have any children. So in this text, in this text, Zachariah's division is called to go and serve in the temple. And, and, and not only is his division called to go and serve in the temple, but Zachariah himself is called to be the one to go in and light the altar of incense. The people were waiting in the outer court. Uh, the priests were waiting and praying and praising in the outer court. And Zachariah's job is to go in and light the altar of incense. And as he goes in to light the altar of incense, uh, the text says that, that Zachariah saw something um, that, that was an angel standing right next to the altar of incense, and Zechariah notices and becomes immediately becomes afraid. The text says the angel notices this and says, Zechariah, don't be afraid. For God has heard your prayers, and your wife Elizabeth will have a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and a whole lot of people will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must not never drink wine nor strong drink, which translated means you can't have Boone's Farm or Hennessy. Um, even before his birth, he will, not, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And with the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteousness of the righteous, excuse me, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And standing in the middle of the inner courts, what started off being a regular normal day, after years and years of praying, turned real quick. And Zechariah looks at the angel and he says, how do I know that this will happen? He's saying, how do, how do I know that this is, this is real? How do I know that once again I won't be let down? How do I know that this just isn't the voice in my head making this up. I'm old, my wife is old, this prayer is old, and we've been dealing with this for so long. And to be honest with you, I'm out of hope. How do I know that this will happen? And the angel replies to, to, to him. He says, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to give you this good news. But, Zechariah, because you did not believe what I'm saying, you will now be unable to speak until the day the child is born. Now, now the text here says that he couldn't speak. But there are some, uh, some theologians who will say that in this moment, he could not speak nor 
could he hear? Zechariah uh, cannot speak, nor can he hear. Now, Zechariah has been in the temple uh, um, um, for so long that now the people are beginning to worry. Um, they're trying to figure out what's going on. Why is he taking so long? And as he comes out and they see that he is unable to speak because now he is motioning them, that, and, and so now they recognize he can't speak and he can't hear, they say, oh, clearly he must have seen a vision from the Lord. He must have had some encounter with the divine. Zachariah could not speak because he did not believe the word from the Lord. Zachariah being unable to speak and hear actually uh, disqualifies him from being doing a, a, being a priest and serving in the temple. Zechariah, because Zechariah was unable to give the required benediction and the required blessing, um, which was a part of his temple service. Therefore, this meant that he could no longer do the thing that he was called to do. This was a punishment for Zechariah's unbelief. And before you get, before you get, you know, start to think, man, Zachariah, that's, that was bogus. Why didn't you believe what the Lord says? Think about it. How many of us have experienced so much failure and, and so much hardship that it was hard to believe the word of the Lord? Whether you want to admit it or not. I'll admit it. There have been times in all of our lives where we've questioned, God, are you real? God, do you really love me? God, why won't you step in and do something? God, why would you allow this to happen in my life? God, why is it that you don't do something? God, I've gone through so many bad times. I've gone through bankruptcy after bankruptcy. I've started a new business and it didn't work. I've tried to be good in this relationship and they still won't treat me right. I've been good to her and they still leave me. I've gone the best and done the best that I can on this job and they still fire me. No one still notices me. God, are you here? So don't think, all of us, don't think that all of us have not been in this same moment that Zachariah has been. We've been in moments where it's been, the pain has been so long that you know that this can't be something that God has allowed. You, you, that God surely doesn't favor me. God's blessing can't be over my life if I'm going through all of this. God, and then when God speaks, you're, you're saying, God, I, I know you're what the Bible says. I know what you're trying to tell me. But God, is this really from you? Hmm. Miscarriage after miscarriage, losing loved one after loved one. God, can I really believe that this is going to happen? Sometimes when we don't believe the word of the Lord, it is beneficial that we keep our mouths shut. Sometimes God has to silence our unbelief long enough for us to be able to see clearly and testify to the real truth of God. Sometimes when it feels like God has taken our ability to speak and our ability to hear, sometimes it is God forcing us to focus our eyes on him. Sometimes it's God's way of saying, I need you to move out of your ability. I need you to see beyond the natural and look at me who can do all things and do things in the supernatural. Sometimes God is doing us a favor by shutting I'm, I'm just saying. And now Zachariah and Elizabeth have to both endure 
the shame of being able to do what they know that they were purposed to do. The text then says that Elizabeth then finds out that she is pregnant. And the Bible says that for the first five months, she remained in in seclusion. She hid. She, She didn't tell anybody. She didn't post it on Facebook. Guess what? Uh, Uh, It's about time. Uh, For the first five months, the Bible says that she remained in seclusion. She could speak, so I could could see her um, uh, at home uh, rubbing her stomach, and, and, and I can see her feeling the change in her body. I can see her beginning to feel the difference as this life begins to, to, to grow inside of her. And the Bible says that she says, the Lord has done this for me and has taken away the disgrace that I have had to endure. Yet, she stayed hidden. If you know anything about a mother, and I'm sure mothers, you can testify to this, if, if, if when you have the struggles that she's having, that, that, that you, even though you're excited, you're also afraid. Because, because you're thinking, God, um, um, is, am I going to be able to hold on to this one. I've, I've had issues before, and is, am I going to look stupid by, by telling everybody what God has done, and then God, and then I lose this one. Uh, the text says that she stayed hidden because she's afraid of another letdown, and many of us today are sitting in that place of Elizabeth that, that we've heard the word, and, and we're starting to see the promise of God, but, but we're afraid that, God, if I really believe you, are you going to let me down? If I really trust that you're going to take care of me, is this really going to happen? I'm going to believe by faith, but I'm also going to put my hands on it. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of something, God, and you can handle the rest, but let me at least hold on to this part because, God, I, I, I've been hurt before, and I don't want to be hurt again. And and, and many of us are in that place. And the Bible says that she stayed hidden because she didn't want to let anybody know. She was afraid of having to continue to deal with the shame. She was tired of dealing with the guilt. She understood the whispers that were happening about her. Y'all know that's the one that can't even have a baby. And she said, God, you have done this for me. You have taken this away. But I don't want to tell nobody just yet because I want to be sure that this is really going to happen. God, I think you're going to save my family, but I don't want to say that because if I say it, then, then, then what if they leave anyway? God, I, I know you're going to fix my money, but what if I start this business and just like the last one fell apart, this one does. God, I, I know you have the ability to heal, but what if you choose not to heal me, God, I need to know. So I'm going to stay hidden until this actually happens. But God, I know you, you've done this for me. What is the hope when we have experienced so much loss and so much pain that we stand in the middle of belief and unbelief? What, what, what is our hope when, 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 when we're like the disciples and we say, Lord, I, I believe, but help my unbelief. What is our hope when, when I could see the sun coming out, but, but I still see the clouds too? Lord, help my unbelief. I need some hope. And my brother And my sister, the hope is that Jesus is coming. As we are preparing for the coming of Jesus, we must trust and recognize our need to depend on Christ alone. Not only 
is Jesus coming. But, but Jesus wants me to tell you that you are a part of his promise, that he has called us to partner with him in what he is doing in the earth, and that he has not forgotten about the promise that he made to you. And not only has he not forgotten about it, but he is going to perform it in your life. That just because it seems like you are silenced, just because it seems like you have always, your heart has been broken, just because it seems like that, that everything is stacked against you, don't worry because be of good cheer. I have already overcome the world and just like I came once, I'm going to come back again. You and I don't have to be afraid. We don't have to feel shame. We don't have to be condemned because the good news is that Jesus is coming. And when Jesus comes, he removes the shame. When Jesus comes, he restores and fixes all of the broken pieces. When Jesus comes, he makes everything all right. When Jesus comes, sickness and disease have to bow. When Jesus comes, communities are restored. When Jesus comes, racism will end. When Jesus comes, families will be fixed. When Jesus comes, he will wipe the tears from our eyes. Be of good cheer, for he has already overcome the world. Jesus is coming. <laughs> the, 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 she says, she says that, that this shame that you, that I have been under, this, the coming, of this child will remove everything that I've had to endure. And I'm here to tell you that with the coming of this child, everything will be all right. Now, can, even though this ain't part of the text, I'm going to go ahead and to take a little preacher's privilege. If you go down to the end of this chapter, what you find is that, that Zachariah couldn't talk until the moment that the baby comes and when they try, the, 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 they're gathering around him and Zachariah, and they say, oh, we're going to name the baby Zachariah. And Zachariah writes out, his name will be John. This indicates that the moment that we begin to agree with the promise of God in our life, God will, will remove the thing that he, you think that he took from you. You and I just have to partner in faith with the thing that God wants to do by simply saying, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I believe that you will take away the shame. I believe that you will take away the stain. I believe that your blood was enough. I believe that you have enough power to do any and every Everything that you have promised me. I believe that we have the power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. I believe that the devil is defeated in my home. I believe that the devil is defeated in my community and our belief and our alignment with God opens up our mouths, opens up our hearing, and restoration begins to flow. Healing begins to flow. The thing that God wants to do and the promise that he created for you begins to happen simply because we believe that God will do the very thing that he said he would do. That we believe that God is not a man that he would lie or, a son, or the son of man that he will repent. When we believe what God says, that it aligns up with what God is doing and the Bible says that now we are the sons of God and the very thing that we don't think we are, we become because we become more like him. Maple Avenue, I got a question for you. Do you believe that God is going to do what he said he would do in your life? Do you believe that God is going to come through even though it doesn't seem like it? Do you believe that God is the ancient of days? Do you believe that he is the bread of life? 
Do you believe that he is the mender of broken hearts? Do you believe that he is God? If you believe he's God, then I want to declare to you that the same place that once was a place of shame will now become your place of favor and your place of joy. I declare that the, the pain is over and the God of the Bible is with you until it comes to pass. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that God, that you, as always, remind us of your promise, that you remind us of your goodness, that you remind us of, of your holiness and your righteousness. God, we thank you that, Lord, that though we live in, between, in the, the already and not yet period, that, God, we, we have a taste of, of what you are doing in our lives. And thank you for that taste. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that assurance that you won't leave us. Thank you for letting us know that you're with us. Thank you for being our God. So, God, we believe you. And your word says that when we believe on you, as the scriptures have said, that out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. So, God, let the rivers flow in our lives, in our community, in every area of our existence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
beloved, be people of hope. Let hope live in your hearts and share the hope of Christ with all you meet. Share hope by noticing someone else's humanity. Share hope by listening to someone else's story. Share hope by praying for our world. And in this Advent season, we need to see, to feel, and to share hope. As you go out in this world, know that you don't go alone, but we go together. And we go with the promise of God that he is with us and that Jesus is coming. Go in peace. Amen.